Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, to one of this week's Arts and Lectures events, the State of Homelessness in Sonoma County. Uh, we are very fortunate to have two community leaders who are at the forefront of the fight to end homelessness in the county today. Dr. Chong will introduce them in just a second. Before we start that, I, I wanted to remind you to uh, put your cell phones on vibrate or off and that we are videotaping this. So that's where the camera is. If you have to leave, please don't walk in front of the camera if you can avoid it. I also wanted to let you know that we have another arts and lecture event on Thursday in the Student Activity Center at noon. Gayla Barron will be our lecturer. She will be, it's sponsored by the 100 Year Celebration Planning Committee and Women's History Month. She will be talking about what if women built a college and everyone came. Sure to be fascinating. If you know gay, you won't want to miss that. So homelessness in Sonoma County, I'm going to go micro real quick before I bring up Dr. Chong and let you know that we did a, a fall 2016 student survey and reported that about 1.4% of our students, or approximately 300, are homeless. And that was a statistically significant survey that we did. And we had, at that time, 21,386 credit students. So that's where we get our numbers. If you look at, of course, that number goes up when you're looking at being housing insecure. And since the fires, of course, again, that number goes up even more. Um, the Wisconsin University's Hope Lab study of March 2017 report was entitled Hungry and Homeless in College. It's the largest survey ever conducted of basic needs and security among community college students. States that 13 to 14 percent of community college students nationwide are housing insecure. If you look at our number of, of uh, credit students, that would be 2,780 students are housing insecure. Uh, that's a big number. But good things are happening, including today's event and some of the uh, information Dr. Chong might share and Jenny Lin and Tom. Uh, one thing I wanted to let you know is that we are passing around cards today so that you could write down your questions. We'll be going through those and at the end we'll have time for Q&A, but we're going to use the cards, not a microphone. So uh, Jeff Rhodes has cards and, and pens and we'll collect those and uh, ask those at the end. So uh, there we go, we're ready to go. You ready to go up there? Heck yeah, I can't even see him. I guess they're ready to go. So I want to bring up our president, superintendent, Dr. Frank Chong. He has been a tireless advocate of bringing housing to this college. And I know good things are happening. And maybe he can talk about that just a touch. Dr. Frank Chong. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to all welcome you, uh, faculty, staff, administrators, our community members, uh, to the JC. You know, I think homelessness is a... Uh, a public policy issue, it's a human rights issue, it's a social justice issue, it's a political issue, it's a very complex issue, but I think at the heart of it, it is really about caring. And today I'm gonna to introduce two very caring individuals that I had the honor and privilege of working with. And let me tell you a little bit about what we've been doing at the JC. Um, we have done surveys, we have a task force around housing for students. Uh, how many remember the JC having dorms before? Raise your hands, yeah. So. It was a policy decision that preceded me that we tear down those dorms because uh, we had other needs for the campus. But history always repeats itself, right? So now we have dorms again. And I was very hesitant actually to get into it because one of my mentors told me, Frank, there's only two ways college presidents lose their jobs, football teams and dorms. <laughs> and I already have a football team that give me gray hairs and dorms are the other ones. Um, but quite honestly, I think we need to really seriously look at that. I've made some inroads in looking to the armory, uh, which is quite contiguous to and close to the JC, and we've had some preliminary discussions to see if the armory would be willing to relocate actually closer to the airport because they are now landlocked. When the armory was built many years ago, the freeway wasn't even there and the college hadn't grown to its extent. So we're trying to convince them with the help of the city and the county, maybe you guys can find a better location closer to the airport where you can actually, uh, most uh, armories are now located closer to the airport in case of uh, emergencies. Uh, they can have supplies and have the trucks go through there and the armory vehicles. Uh, if you drive armory drive, you can barely get your car through it, let alone you see those big vehicles. They are parked in the parking lot. So that's one area we're looking at. We've also been meeting with uh, developers throughout uh, Sonoma County to see if their interests in building student housing or employee housing were not close to having employee housing as well because that's become an issue for many of our employees to find affordable housing while working here. 
Um, so I think it's, uh, we're doing a lot, but we, we could be doing more. We're gonna, we just hired a consultant called Skyon. They're a national student housing uh, consultant that helps do needs assessments. And uh, they, many of them may be contacting you all in the next few weeks when they do their work. And they're gonna come back to us with a report about what needs to be done and for us to really get into that field. None of us are experts on student housing. It's a very specialized field. Now I'd like to have the opportunity to introduce these uh, two great people, Jenilyn Holmes. Uh, Jenilyn, um, I've gotten to know in the community. She is everywhere. Uh, I don't think she sleeps. And she sees me and says, Dr. Chong, I see you everywhere. But I'm sure many of you see her where I'm not. Because Jenilyn, says she's a tireless advocate for the homelessness, homeless issue. And she's been working with Catholic Charities, heading their initiatives that span uh, not just this state, but throughout Northern California and Oregon, I understand. Uh, so I'm really, really uh, f fortunate to have someone who really cares so deeply about this issue and very pragmatic. I, I kind of, uh, I would put her under the uh, category of a practical idealist, you know, <laughs> somebody who's practical but also idealistic, which is very rare. Uh, and behind me, watching my back, uh, is none other than uh, Tom Schwedholm. I met Tom when I first uh, started here. He was just retiring as the chief of police. Uh, Tom is a graduate of SRJC. Uh, and uh, Jenilyn's uh, husband is going to be soon to be graduate of SRJC. So we like to be, bring people here who support our college. You know, Tom uh, not only went to the JC, but after he graduated, one of the first things he said to me is, uh, Dr. Chong, how can I help? So I put him on our foundation, and Tom served on our foundation to help us raise money. You know, he's had a distinguished career in law enforcement, and now being a member of the city council, uh, he is really working uh, to take the issue of homelessness head on. So we have two wonderful people to uh, engage you, to educate you, and also engage in, in conversation. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Jenilyn Holmes and Tom Schwedholm. Thank you. So my first question I wanted to ask you, what in the heck are you folks doing here on a Monday afternoon in this beautiful blue sky? <laughs> you know, it, it's, kinda, it's a serious question because um, it, people have asked me that, given my background that you heard Dr. Chong talk about. Tom, why do you care about the homeless? And so first of all, I want to thank you for being here because for me, it is the single biggest issue facing our community right now. So I retired in December of 2013 as the chief of police here in Santa Rosa after a 31 year career. And it was interesting there from my perspective, when you're the chief in the police department, you look at the issue of homelessness from a very narrow perspective of public safety. Because um, I have a lot of experience, like going back to gang violence, think back in the early 2000s when we had a bigger gang issue than we have right now. You had an issue with gang members, who would you call? you'd call the police. And then you dig a little deeper and you start studying, why do kids join gangs? And if you think about it and understand the reasons why, they want to be belong, they want to be part of something, it's a way to gain stature. Are the police the best folks to deal with that? Absolutely not. And so we now have our violence prevention partnership and we look at a holistic approach. It's a community-wide issue needing a community-wide response. I look at the issue of homelessness the same way. Until recently, who would you call if you had an issue, someone who you thought was homeless, who would you call? You'd call the cops. And in their tool bag, do you think they're the people most equipped, best equipped to deal with that issue? It's a complex social issue. So for me, when I became on the city council, there's some things, you know, I, I had the benefit of understanding how the city worked, but there's a whole bunch of unknowns for me getting on council. You know, two things were land use and water. Oh my gosh. Um, big learning curves on that. But same thing with homelessness. So rather than just looking at homelessness from a public safety perspective, but it's a holistic approach to it. And so for me, I really try to be solution oriented. And before I'm gonna propose a solution to how do we end homelessness, not how do we continue to manage it, which in my opinion, what we've been doing uh, in recent years, how do we end it? You need to understand the system. And holy smokes, what a complex system it is. But that's what I've been committed to since I got on the council in November of uh, 2014. Seems like, what, three years ago, but about 10 years ago. Um, because it's such a complex system. I've gone to leadership trainings in West Virginia to find out how other people, other leaders in this nation are addressing it. Most recently, Jenny Lynn and I went uh, a couple months ago to Arizona to same, same thing, to learn what's working in other communities, because let's not rep recreate the wheel. And what a lot of things that I've learned is that a lot of people are putting investment because it feels good. But is it ending homelessness or is it just continuing to manage the issue? So today I want to challenge you to 
help us be a little bit more resourceful for what we're going to do. So what Jenny Lynn is going to do is talk a little bit about the nature and the stat status of homelessness in Sonoma County. And I'll be talking about some of the things that the city of Santa Rosa has been recently doing to try to address this issue. And then we're also going to offer some things that, uh, for you, what you can do to help us address this issue. So without further ado, Jenny Lynn. <laughs> so she's got a wireless mic, and I've got this one, so we're going to try to dance around this. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Tom. So um, just really quick to talk a little bit about why we do this work, and particularly why I have... Uh, invested so much of time and life into it. It's, it's because it's, when you get down to the core of homelessness, it's people. It's human beings that for some reason something happened and they've ended, falling th ended up falling through every single safety net in our entire community and landed into this situation of homelessness where pe we're, we're talking life and death situations. And it was really apparent to me when I first started my career at Catholic Charities, which if you told me that I'd be doing what I'm doing right now, I would never, ever have believed you. I was born and raised in Santa Rosa, and my goal was to be the first person in my family to graduate college. And that was my goal. And then I was like, oh, I'm coming in, and I'm graduating. And then I'm like, oh, no, I have, what do I do next? Because <laughs> I was all I had been focused on was to be that first person to, to take that step. And I ended up getting a part-time job at Catholic Charities, walking in the very first day, I remember so distinctly, with all of the myths and stereotypes that people think about when they think about homelessness. And what I quickly found out in those first few days was that and what people think of homelessness is, is absolutely not what it is. Homelessness is about people and it's about changing their lives and providing them a reason to feel hopeful again. And it was very apparent to me one day when I met this uh, little girl named Hannah. And I was working in our family shelter in that day and happened to be in the front lobby. And I see this seven-year-old girl walk in with her older brother and her older sister and her grandmother. And I would come to find out a little bit later that they were with their grandmother because their mother had abandoned them in the grocery store just a few months before had just walked away from these three beautiful kids and just left them there. I hadn't seen her since. Now, luckily for these three kids, Grandma walked in and said, I will take care of you. I don't want you to end up in the foster care system, but how many of you know how expensive kids can be? And, yeah. And so when they were trying to keep their family together, they ended up falling into homelessness and bouncing around from place to place until they finally heard about our, our shelter. And I so distinctly remember it because she walked in and she was so scared. And she wouldn't look anyone in the eye, and she would, was really confused and not sure what was going on. And I just remember being so triggered back to the way I grew up and the way I felt, invisible, that no one cared, and all of these different scenarios. And I was really just touched by how we can make this different for her. So we quickly got her enrolled in some of our programs at our family shelter. And after just a few months, I started to see this beautiful, brilliant, bright little girl coming out of her shell. And I'll never forget the moment that I decided I am dedicating my life to ending homelessness. And I ha was having to be sitting in my office one day, and I hear this running down the hallway. And the first thing I think is, the kids know they're not supposed to be running. So <laughs> what's happening? But in comes Hannah into my office. And she's waving this piece of paper. And she goes, Miss Jenny, Miss Jenny, look. Look, look, look. So I opened it up and it was her progress report. And I looked and she was getting all A's and B's. But that was not what was most important. What was most important is what she said to me next. She looked me so seriously in the eye and she goes, Miss Jenny, do you want a copy that you can hang on your wall? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Yes, but it was this moment where I realized this is how we're going to end homelessness. We're going to reinstill hope in people who have felt hopeless, in people who are unsure of what their path is going to be, people who have been forgotten and invisible in our community. And one by one, believing in them, listening to them, reinstilling that hope, that's how we're going to end homelessness. So what does a person who's recently out of college do when they're trying to become the best they can be to try to end a social issue? I dug into the research. <laughs> and unfortunately, the research just made me more frustrated and upset that people didn't care more about it. And here's what I found out. So on a national perspective, on any given night in the United States, there are over half a million people who are homeless. In a country this well off, how can we be OK that there are this many people not sure where they're going to get their next meal, not sure where they're going to lay their head. Close to half of these people are in families. And there are 47,000 veterans who are experiencing homelessness. People who fought for our freedom, risked their own lives, and have come back, and we can't even provide homes for them. 
these were the things that were starting to get me really frustrated with the status quo and that we needed to do more. What I also found out is that 92% of mothers who are experiencing homelessness have experienced severe physical and or sexual abuse during their lifetime. And for 63%, this abuse was perpetrated by an intimate partner. Children who are homeless are sick four times more often than other children, and they go hungry at twice the rate. And this was the one that really got me. People who experience homelessness are three to four times more likely to die prematurely than their housed counterparts, and they experience an average life expectancy as low as 41 years. People are dying because we have not been able to understand the complexity of this issue and pursue real long-term solutions. That's what I was starting to find out. And that's why everybody who's sitting in this room, it's so important you're here because you're getting educated about how you can be a part of the solution. Because I can promise you, it's not gonna be Tom and I solving it alone. It's gonna be everybody working together in the same direction. So then what does it look like here locally in Sonoma County? So locally, on any given night, we have 2,800 people who are experiencing homelessness in Sonoma County. You think about the rain and all of that that we've been experience, experiencing the last couple of weeks, people have been trying to survive through that. Of that, we have 65% are literally unsheltered, so we don't have enough shelter space right now for everybody who's experiencing homelessness in the entire county. This is a breakdown by jurisdiction, um, and you can see where people are within the county. Overwhelmingly, Santa Rosa holds the majority of the homeless population, about 1,600 people. But if you look at the numbers from 2016 to 2017, homelessness is actually down in Santa Rosa by 16%. And that's huge, and a lot of it has to do with what Tom's gonna talk a little bit later about in terms of investing in evidence-based practices that are starting to work, we're starting to see this. And overwhelmingly, if you look at all of the data, homelessness is down between uh, you know, 2015 to 2017 by 37%. And that is unheard of in a Bay Area community that we're actually reducing homelessness. Most communities in, in Sonoma or in the Bay Area or in Northern California or California in general, numbers are staying the same, going down maybe a little bit, but mostly going up too. So we're actually on the right pathway with a lot of investment in what's been happening, especially looking at housing focused programs. So this is a breakdown of some of the population in, uh, in Sonoma County. So we have uh, uh, 598 individuals who are chronically homeless. And what we mean by chronically homeless at a high level is typically the people who've been homeless the longest period of times have some of the most complex issues are typically the ones you see and often are misperceived in the community. Um, they, all of people who are chronically homeless also are experiencing some form of disability, whether it's mental health or a physical disability. We have 211 veterans who are experiencing homelessness. Um, families, we have 111 families, and um, I would say those numbers are actually up right now, especially after the wildfire. Um, our, we have a centralized waiting list for families experiencing homelessness, and that's actually up to about 130 families right now. Uh, unaccompanied children, 160 individuals, and unaccompanied transition-aged youth, which I'll define. Transition-aged youth means people from ages 18 to 24, so probably a lot of peers here at the JC. Uh, there's 416 individuals. So then you can get break, break down even further. And a lot of this information, I'm happy to share the, the PowerPoint at the end, because this is an overwhelming amount of data, I know. Uh, but you can look gender-wise, um, it's predominantly male. Um, we have 26% of the population is under the age of 24, and 74% are over the age of 25. Um, you can look here, this is a really interesting one. The primary event or condition that led to homelessness, 24% uh, say they lost their job. 19% said they had an argument with family or friends. That's typical. Usually before someone enters homelessness for the first time, they're usually what we call couch surfing, uh, staying on friends and family's beds um, until something happens that they can no longer do that. That's something we're kind of trying to keep an eye on right now, especially post uh, wildfire in terms of we know there's a lot of people couch surfing right now and some of our trends in the past have shown that the, those times will end soon potentially for some families. 
Over here, you'll see that 74% of the people who are experiencing homelessness are interested in permanent housing. They said yes. Another 15% said perhaps. Only a small percentage said no. And, and that no is a little bit more complex than one might think. Um, there's a lot of individuals who um, have been so far marginalized and homeless for so long that they've literally readapted to their circumstances where they have literally think that homelessness is the norm not being homeless is not the norm. And so it's part of it is trying to understand and break that uh, difficulty for them. And then 41% of survey respondents said that they uh, reported some sort of disabling condition. And you can kind of see the breakdown. Some of it's overlapping. But one thing I'll mention about this is that um, this is self-reported disabling condition. And a lot of people maybe haven't been diagnosed yet or are not willing to admit or say, I have some sort of you know, post-traumatic stress disorder or, or emotional condition. So we do think this is an underreported um, amount of information, but some of the best data that we have right now. And then some of the school data that Robert uh, talked about earlier is also mentioned here. So now that we kind of understand what does it look like? So what are the solutions that are being actively looked at in our community and in a nationwide perspective? So I want to spend a minute talking about Housing First versus Housing Readiness. How many of you have heard of Housing First? All right, that's good news. <laughs> well, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about it so that people can kind of understand when we talk about this language. Um, so first, I'm going to walk you through the top part, how, the typical housing readiness. And housing readiness is how people have done this for years, how, how people have solved homeless, tried to solve homelessness for years. And, you know, homelessness is, a, is, is new, it, you know, homeless services or social services is a new field, right? We didn't really have a professionalization of it up until, you know, a decade or so ago. It really was just people were trying to solve things from a charitable standpoint. And what I mean by that is, you know, if someone's hungry, give them food. If someone needs a, a, a bed, well, why don't you come crash on a, on a pew in our church? And that's a really important thing. But what we're trying to pivot to more is using that as an engagement tool to actually solve the reason why they're hungry, the reason why they need a bed. And if we can go back to those root causes of why someone's in that situation, that's kind of the professionalization that we're trying to take in terms of being the best stewards of our money and you know, making sure that we're solving this issue rather than just continuing to manage it. So a few years ago, if you were a person experiencing homelessness, this was how you had to go through the system. First, you had to go to emergency shelter, which you can see um, right there. So emergency shelter. And then while you were in shelter, we were going to try to fix you or get your issues fixed, right? That was typically what would happen. We'd deal with all the issues. And, it, and if you did well and we were able to make some progress on some of the issues, then we would put you in transitional housing. And transitional housing was a period of time, two years, you would live in a unit, still be st uh, typically defined as homeless, and we would continue to work on all those issues. And then if you did well, then we would put you in permanent housing, okay? So what are the major problems with this, right? First, what it says is that you have to earn housing. You have to go through steps A, B, and C, and then we'll give you permanent housing, right? But housing is a basic human right that everyone deserves, and no one should have to earn housing in any community or in across the nation. So that's the first issue with this. The second issue when you start looking is that it actually creates these, these red areas, these fail points. And for people who have higher need, higher issues, they are not able to do steps A, B, and C to get into permanent housing. And so people with extreme mental health issues or physical conditions actually would fall out of our system of care and it became our chronically homeless population that you have see across the nation and especially you can see here in sonoma county we do have a high number of chronically homeless individuals because our systems over the nation and over the years created a system that did not work for them and that's the typical that's typically what sometimes happens in programs and i see it even locally is that people design programs and expect the person to meet the program rather than designing our programs to meet the person and that's what the housing readiness model says now what are we moving to 
Housing first. At its core means as soon as possible, we're going to get someone into a home. And once we get them into a home, then we'll address the issues that may have brought them to homelessness in the first place, whether it was mental health, income, so on and so forth. So there could be a lot of pathways to get into it. Some people might take a shelter route. Some people might take some sort of other interim housing, or some people might you know, move straight from a camp. But regardless, our end goal is permanent housing as quickly as possible, because then once they're in the home, that's when they can address the issues. Because think about it, if you're living in an encampment, how do you expect to show up to work, go do a job interview with everything you have on your back, right? You have to be able to have that stability of a home to address the issues. And the data shows this is true. The housing readiness model, the success rate hovers around 40 to 45%. The housing first success rate, research backed, and I can give you two pages of peer reviewed research journals on this, show it's more cost effective and it has an 85% success rate of people actually staying, getting housed and staying housed. So the data shows this is a better intervention for us to move to. And the other component of what Housing First says is we're not gonna just pick the people who are most ready, which is what the first system did. We're gonna pick the people who need us the most. Right. And if you liken it to an emergency room. OK, so if you're going into an emergency room and let's say that earlier that day you stubbed your toe and you think that, you know, it might be broken. You're not sure all the, your regular doctors not here. You need to go to the emergency room because you need to figure out if it's broken. Right. And you show up at, let's say, seven o'clock at night. Well, let's say Tom comes in at 725 experiencing some sort of cardiac arrest episode. Right. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> you'll be fine, I promise. You're, you'll be fine, right? Okay, so you're the triage nurse. Who are you going to serve first? The person who got here at 7 or the person with the more, more life-threatening illness? You're going to serve Tom, right? And we've never done that for years. For, every, for years, it was a first come, serve, first serve. You got here at 7, you get served before this guy who showed up at 710, even though that guy might die if we don't get him into services. And so what we do now through Housing First is actually prioritize people, assess their vulnerability, and bring the people who are more vulnerable into the services as quickly as possible, and make sure we aren't over-serving part of our population because that has typically happened and make sure we're not underserving another part of our population who really could die if we don't bring them into services. So that's part of the other shift with Housing First. And I'll mention one more thing that we've been, we've been working on as well and then turn it back to Tom to talk about the city. Um, coordinated entry system is a part of the Housing First component. And again, tons of research that shows that this works. So coordinated entry system, what it really does, if you're a person experiencing homelessness a couple of years ago, you have to go to five or six different shelters and manage five or six different processes or waiting lists. And maybe you'd get in and you'd have to keep calling and figure it out. And us as nonprofits, we all had the same people, but five waiting lists. And it was just a lot of work. And so you saw this often happening. Someone trying to get to a home and they're just trying to figure out the maze, or I call the gauntlet sometimes, of services. And if you're a person who's in trauma, survival mode, chaos, crisis, you cannot expect someone to be able to do that appropriately. And I don't even know if it's something that we could do, you know, as educated individuals who maybe know the system. So what coordinated entry does is instead we're assessing people at the bottom level through one single front door of services, we're navigating them to the appropriate place based on their vulnerability, based on their housing needs, and then we're connecting them with the housing and supports. So now if you're a person experiencing homelessness, you can go to one person, be on one waiting list, and actually get into any shelter or housing bed in the entire county. We piloted this for two years with families here in Sonoma County, and what we found was during that two-year period, we saw uh, the average length of a family experiencing homelessness go from 196 days to 57 days because we got more efficient with our resources and we act in a coordinated way rather than these sporadic approaches. And so now we're in the process of moving our single adult system into the same format, modeling based off of what we've done with the families. So does Housing First work in Sonoma County? So how many of you have heard of the Palms Inn? 
Oh my gosh, there's a lot more hands on Housing First, but that's okay. Um, that's great. <laughs> so the Palms Inn is a great example, and it's a program that um, Catholic Charities currently operates. And what we did is we converted a 104-unit motel into permanent supportive housing for veterans and for the chronically homeless individuals. If you remember, the chronically homeless individuals are the sometimes more difficult to serve. And what we did is we spent a period of two years, or, or one year at that point, with our street outreach team actually working to assess uh, the individuals and finding out who are the people who are most vulnerable in our community. And what we, you know what we did is we put them into housing. And by putting them in housing, I mean we were literally moving them from their camp and moving them into a unit, nothing in between. And the emotional experience for a lot of the individuals when they first worked in, moved in, was very overwhelming. We had individuals, I had, we had one person who had been homeless for 30 years, had not lived in a unit. We had people who couldn't sleep in their bed and they slept on their floor because the bed was too soft and they'd been sleeping on the sidewalk for years. We had people who came up to us and said, I feel really bad saying this, but I don't even know how to go, like, where do I begin to go grocery shopping? I mean, these were the things we were working with in individuals, and it was a, a total shift in how we provide services, because this isn't how we've done it in the past. We took the most vulnerable, and we literally, our case managers weren't just working on budgets and working on income. We were going to the grocery store with them and helping them shop. We were teaching them how to re-clean their, clean their rooms because that was nothing they had to do for years. And we were helping them stay engaged with the program because when people have been homeless for that long, everything within them screams sometimes to go back to that situation. And so we were trying to get them to create new positive support networks here in a new, in a new way. And so it's really overwhelming when people are moving into housing. And that's one of the things we had to learn and readjust with this project. And so not only was it great for the people we've been able to serve, but it's also had a huge impact on our community. So here's what we found in the first, this is just the first six months of the Palms Inn. Admittance to the emergency room and inpatient hospitalization reduced by 45% for the people living there. Interactions with law enforcement reduced by 77%. Ambulance transportation reduced by 56%. And usage of crisis services such as suicide hotlines and domestic violence hotlines reduced by 98%. So we were showing not only a better quality of life for the individuals, but a, a community cost savings, an economic opportunity for our community to invest in these services and actually get a return from that perspective as well. What we also found out was that after one year of operations, veterans' homelessness declined by 23%. Chronic homelessness declined by 20%, and homelessness in Santa Rosa, where we predominantly worked on the individuals bringing them in, declined by 16%. So it shows locally, it is a great investment, it is a cost savings, and housing is how we're going to reduce homelessness in our community. So if we were able to you know, take the palms in and scale it by five or six more, you could multiply that, the cost savings, the de decline in numbers the same way. But we need to have the support, the political will, and the community buy-in to say, we're not okay that people are homeless. We know interventions that work, and we need to pursue those with every piece of our body and making sure that we're resolving people's homelessness because we know it's working nationally and here locally. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Tom, and we'll talk about uh, the city of Santa Rosa and then open it up for questions. And you'll keep the mic there. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> So one of the things I want to talk about was the whole system. You've probably all heard of the uh, HUD de Department of HUD, I guess that's what they're calling HUD. And I think, I haven't read Twitter yet, but I think Ben, Dr. Carson is still the director. Um, <laughs> one of the challenges with it, one of the challenges with it, HUD is mandating, they're only funding um, housing first programs. So think about that. So at the federal level, and this is where I see the greatest potential, the federal level, they're saying, we are only going to fund housing first models. That's great. Where do you think the state of California is? Well, the state passed a law, I think it was SB 1380, that by 2019, the state of California is gonna be a housing first state. And so when it came to the city of Santa Rosa, I, I'm researching this, and I'm like, well, why do we need to wait on the state? And I'll talk a little bit um, about why the state is choosing to wait to 2019. Why don't we go ahead and do it now? So the city of Santa Rosa um, adopted that philosophy and implementation in 2016. And what that means is that the city of Santa Rosa, we are only going to fund and support programs that are consistent with housing first. That's a huge step. Show me another 
community-wide issue where the feds, the state, and the city are on the same page. Let's just give one example, cannabis. Think about that. Where are the feds, the state, and the city on that issue? It's complex and there's mixed messages, but can you imagine if we put all our resources, we're on the same page, the same stream, swimming in the same direction? That's the hope that I have for Housing First. Why would some people not jump on board? And this is, the, the, the county is also, uh, they haven't adopted it quite yet, but let's say you've been a homeless service provider providing services. Jenny Lynn talked about prioritizing, you know, the heart attack victim before you, the stub toe victim. Um, Ian DeJong, who's a, a subject matter expert in this, created this thing called the VI SPDAT. It's a vulnerability index, right? So you ask, you know, it's subject matter experts, they ask these questions, interview them, and assess their vulnerability. It's their vulnerability to die on the streets. So if you're about at zero through four, that would mean that you can probably end your homelessness on your own. Why is that important? Well, if we have someone who on the VI scale is in Sam Jones Hall, our shelter, that might not be the most appropriate use of that space. This is someone who could end it on their own. If you have someone in like the five through eight, five through nine scale, they need a little bit of assistance. One of the programs that we fund is uh, rapid rehousing. That's someone that needs a little bit of help to end their homelessness. But typically if they're above a 10, and the scale goes from like a 10 to 20, you need some permanent supportive housing. And what's our example of permanent supportive housing in Sonoma County? Palms in. Unfortunately, there's only 104 units there. Do you think out of the 2,800 people in Sonoma County are experiencing homelessness on the point in time count, do you think we need more than 104 people who've been assessed greater than a 10 on the VI SPDAT? Absolutely. And so one of our asks, what you can do, we need to find some more locations like the Palms Inn. It's a model that works that we've done here. It's not cheap, but, it's, but, it, but it does work. One of the challenges we're having, Jenny Lynch showed uh, coordinated entry. What if you're that non-profit -serv non service provider that you start taking more vulnerable population into your facility. What's gonna happen with your metrics for success? Probably gonna go down. What's that mean to your funders? Yeah, it's a challenge. And we're actually experiencing that now where some wanna put the brakes on it. Hey, I don't wanna take the most vulnerable because our numbers are horrible and they're being interpreted that your program doesn't work. Although I have to look at it, no, you're taking the most vulnerable. The service, the people that need it most, you're actually providing them. We've had some experiences at the Palms Inn. This is a statistical data point. Prior to the Palms Inn, or since the Palms Inn has opened, more people have actually died at the Palms Inn than before. Why do you think that is? I would argue because we've got the most vulnerable people that are out there. And there are some people who've lived on the streets for 30 years, and now all of a sudden they have housing. At least they're, they're, they're passing with dignity. But some people are saying the Palms Inn doesn't work because more people have died there than ever before. Those are the type of system conversations we're having. And to me, once you look at the data, the, well, of course it does. And no one's happy that more people have passed away. But after 30 years living on the street, it's, it's taxing on the body. So some of the things that the city of Santa Rosa is doing are up here. We declared a state of emergency. Uh, I don't know, Thomas Ells, I saw just came in. Uh, we've extended it. It's probably about at least a year and a half. The reason we did that, do we think by declaring that we'll click our heels and homelessness will go away? Absolutely not. But it gives us some ability that if opportunities come forward, we don't have to go through the bureaucratic process to allow someone like our CHAP program or some other benefits. We don't have to go through the normal Planning Commission Design Review Board. When we had after the first, I believe it was the fire, when did the SAY shelter come in? Uh, last year, where SAY, Social Advocates for Youth, ran a um, transitional age youth shelter in the bottom floor of the Press Democrat building. The only way they are able to do it like that, because we declared the emergency, the city manager had the authority to waive some of the normal rules. So I think it has had an impact. Our Housing First philosophy we spoke of, funded housing focused shelter. That's huge. Before, so we have our Sam Jones Hall. Before we added additional resources there, it was more of a destination. Right? And to get people out of there to find housing, who typically would be looking for housing? Maybe social workers. If anyone's taken any college course credits for social workers, how, much, how many real estate classes do they teach you? Yeah, probably not. That doesn't make sense. Well, what if we actually put some housing locators and ha housing navigators as part of this funding program? The people that know how to find housing will do that and then we'll pair with the social workers. The other thing that we added were, was um, some resources towards diversion. There are no predictors of future homelessness. The only indicator is that if you've been homeless, experienced homeless once, you're more likely to experience it again. 
well, what if we were able to prevent you from ever experiencing it in the first time? In other words, talking to the person, okay, do you have any parents? Do you have families? Do, can we reunite the family? Are there s uh, some other resources? Because someone who is on the verge of experiencing homelessness may not be thinking about that. Well, why don't we put a professional who's actually thought about that and try to help them to prevent their becoming homelessness in the first place? That's more of a long-term strategy. So that's what we mean by uh, housing-focused shelter. And our homeless outreach services team, our host team, they are rock stars out there. These are the boots on the ground. We have outreach workers, we have mental health workers, social advocates for youth is there, and a big referral to the host team is the Santa Rosa Police Department, our downtown enforcement team. They have interactions with these folks on a daily basis. And I gotta tell you, I, I, I know many of you would expect me to say this, but our downtown enforcement team are rock stars. They have built relationships. The whole idea of community policing in this community is very true. You spend any time with them, and I spend a lot of time with two of our officers, Jason and Brian, and when I hear them and see them interact with people who are experiencing homelessness, they're on a first name basis. There's one individual who's uh, got somewhat of a methamphetamine addict. Brian uh, or Jason tells me at one point they're chasing him, he got called for uh, some sort of a call. He's chasing and Jason calls out to this gentleman, hey, it's Brian, oh! He literally stops, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was you. Here's my pipe, here's my knife. Where does that happen? That wasn't the first time they encountered each other. They're building a relationship. And that's why the downtown enforcement team are key partners with our host team. And Jenny Lynn, I think, and well, don't get her started on that because she, she won't stop. It's awesome. Clean start shower trailer. Well, providing a shower trailer ends someone's homelessness. Absolutely not. But what it does do, it's an engagement tool. It puts someone in contact with someone who knows how to provide the services. And I got news for you, it's probably not that first time they take, use those facilities, but if they realize, no, this is just, we're here to help, and I've talked to some of the drivers of the uh, Clean Start Shower Trailer, first time, you know, you have to sign in, they'll just use their, you know, initials. Second time, their first name. Third time, you know, maybe the first and last name. Now all of a sudden they start engaging in a conversation. That's how you build that relationship to say, hey, we're here, here to help. Because I can't force anyone to end their homelessness just like I can't force you to do anything. That person has to come to that understanding and recognition this is what's best for them. When it happens, it's up to them. And we have new, a number of different experiences about continuing to be there, continue to be there, continue to be there. We have to wait till it's time for them. Can you uh, flip that one? I wanted to put a face to this. So um, I've shared this slide with a couple of, uh, like tomorrow's leaders today, some youth. And it's always helpful for me, you know, what is the face of homelessness? And if you think about what would you want written about you on your obituary? So this was known as Chucky to family because his awesome laugh, he was just like a chuckle. He was a devoted father, loved his children. He was an actor, had a love of the arts, professional figure skater, traveled to Europe to perform, was the first man to land a triple axle. Pretty cool. It was always his happiest when he was ice skating, dancing, or acting. He was a slick dresser, smooth gentleman, charismatic, and always happy. Hit the next one. So that's Chucky, what he looked like shortly before he passed away on the streets of Santa Rosa. Chuck really uh, meant something to me because I live in northwest Santa Rosa. And I recall he was at uh, Industrial in Cleveland, was his camp, right by the Shell Station. They allowed him to stay there. And I remember my wife said, hey, what happened to the guy that was there? He didn't know it was Chucky. I didn't know it was Chucky. But you start looking into it a little bit, and I know, and Jenny Lynn can't comment on this, but I know services were offered to him but he never accepted them. And I'm not saying that it's his fault. I think it's our fault, the system's fault. Because we all, this bureaucracy, we create all these different programs, but if it's not helping the client, the person we're trying to assist, then we fail. We need to try something else. And unfortunately, that's the face of homelessness in Santa Rosa. He was a real person who was really contributing. He had family. So when I see people like downtown, uh, we talked to a lot of different businesses, and they say, oh, you know, the homeless are driving business away. That's not the face of homelessness for me. I spend a lot of time at the Family Support Center. The face of homelessness for me are the kids lined up to take a school bus to go to school. That's also the face of homelessness. So I'm really hoping people in this community start getting educated more because they're not demons, they're real people. Ian says, and I won't drop an F-bomb because we're on the junior college, uh, <laughs> but he says if, if the, the clients you're serving aren't telling you F off at least once a day, you're not dealing with the right people. Because quite frankly, those are the most vulnerable. So I want to read one of Ian's quotes. Any homelessness is simple. Quite frankly, it is. 
Give people a place to live with the supports they need to stay there. That doesn't mean it's easy, but it's simple. Do the right things in the right order, and you'll get the same results over and over again. And the more you do a simple thing, the easier it becomes. So I think now we would like to open it up yes. for questions. Questions, and I think that um, one thing I'll just add on what Tom said is about for the, the Palms Inn with the, the deaths that were mentioned is that um, a lot of those people were terminal and there is no pr place in Sonoma County that a, homeless, a person who's experiencing homelessness can go where they can actually receive hospice care. And we, the Palms Inn has been the first opportunity that people who are experiencing homelessness that are in the end of life can actually go and receive hospice care. And so that's something that is an important need in our community and, and is misunderstood when you think about just some of the raw things out there. So it's about understanding the stories behind some of the things that are happening. All right, well, let's give them a quick hand for the work that they just did. <laughs> We won't get through all these questions, I promise you, because there's so many of them, but we'll do the best we can. Before uh, we start with Q&A, I did want to recognize uh, Deanna Rogers, our coordinator of our Student Resource Center, and the work that she's done on this campus to be a liaison to the community and the resources that, that we're providing. We are a signature away from being part of the coordinated entry system. Yay! And so once we... <laughs> once... <laughs> Thank you, Deanna, and visit her in the Resource Center if you have questions about housing resources and food insecurity. Uh, so we're going to start with, there were a couple questions about the status of the camp on Sebastopol Road, what the plans are. Uh, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, so right now, uh, Kathy Charities has op opened what's being called a, an, an interim navigation center, and we're working with individuals who are living in the large encampment behind uh, the Dollar Tree in Roseland Village to uh, do assessments and triage, as I mentioned earlier, working to get people into some sort of <clears throat> temporary and or uh, permanent housing option. As of last Friday, we've been able to place 22 people into some sort of housing option. Um, we have um, 11 people planned to go into the Palms Inn, actually, in the next one to three months. And we are currently working with the rest of the individuals on their own interim options as well. Um, and so that's the, what Catholic Charities responsibility is, is doing uh, the navigation center and bringing in additional services for people who are experiencing homelessness there. Are there parking lots? There was another question about any parking lots that are currently allowing uh, homeless folks to park there and use Yeah, the so um, Catholic Charities will, um, for several years actually operated a safe parking program, which was for people living in their vehicles. Um, and we had scattered sites throughout the community. Unfortunately, that program was defunded. And so we were no longer able to offer the same amount of uh, safe parking sites as we used to have, but we do have some still at our existing properties at our family shelter and our um, Nightingale Medical Respite Shelter, uh, just as a smaller scope. Got it. There were some questions about what city or region has the most experience with housing first, uh, some successful models that people could look at. Go ahead, Tom. Medicine Hat in Canada is one. There's several. There's Salt Lake City in Utah. Um, there's, I can they're, say they're, if anybody wants it, there's a. I have two pages worth of peer-reviewed links, and I can send you all. I can send you that information. But yeah, there is a community in New Jersey called Bergen County, New Jersey. Uh, it's apparently right across the river from New York City. They received. Um, they got to functional zero. I think it was last year. The the first community that actually got to functional zero. And what we mean by functional zero, I don't think you'll ever get to absolute zero, where there'll be absolutely no one experiencing homelessness. But in a set period of time typically a, a, a time frame of 30 days. If someone experiences ho um, homelessness, if we can find them housing within 30 days, we've achieved functional zero. And quite frankly, that's what our goal here is in, in Sonoma County. Let's get to functional zero. But Bergen County, New Jersey has done it using the housing first model. They started housing first in 2007. They all got together and it can work. It just takes some time. Very good. A uh, couple questions about the palms. Uh, was the 16% reduction in homelessness due to the palms? And who provides the funding for the palms? Yeah, so the 16% reduction, part of it, it's not all to contribute, but it's definitely a big piece of it, especially in Santa Rosa, because we primarily, we, because it was partially funded by the city of Santa Rosa, we had to serve people who were uh, in the city of Santa Rosa. So when you look at the actual data of individuals, and we have HMIS, Teddy Pierce is here as an expert in a lot of this, and she can you know, talk much more nuanced in it than me, but if you actually look at the human individuals that are in some of our data systems, you can see people who have been homeless for several years, and they're 
housing resolved in that year period where there's a 16% reduction, and the Palms Inn is, is their housing destination and their reason why. Again, it's not the entire reason why there's a 16% reduction, but definitely can point to several of it. The more people we house, the more the numbers go down, right? Um, in terms of funding, the Palms Inn's funded from a lot of sources. Um, there's money from uh, city, county, um, state, and federal. So it's, it's literally every single funding source kind of brought together to make that project work. And then they were asking if there are other places where you've used housing first, other places where those uh, homeless people are being placed other than Palms? Are there other locations? Yeah, so yeah, there's not just the Palms. The Palms is definitely the one that's best set up to serve people who are um, most vulnerable because there's so much on-site services, but we actually have different scattered sites throughout the county um, where cafeterias will go in and master lease a program, master lease a home, and then sublease it to an individual. Uh, there's also other service providers that are doing something similar um, in terms of doing rapid rehousing programs where we actually go and rent units for these individuals and move them into a unit like you would find on Craigslist um, and have them reintegrated into the neighborhood. So there's a, there's a scattered amount of, of housing across the county. Um, Cabot Charities, in any given moment, we have about three to 400 units of housing across the county of people living in them. Uh, any coordination with Sonoma County Jail? Yes. <laughs> that was actually something that was really important and um, is, is also one of part of the best practices. If, if, law, if our law enforcement uh, partners don't have an alternative, they, they're limited in what their options can be, and sometimes that unfortunately takes an enforcement option. Um, and so what we want to do is provide an alternative. So we've actually gotten our outreach workers um, through background with the sheriff's department, and they can actually go into the jail and do outreach with individuals and discharge planning for people. Because what often happens when someone's in jail is they'll get released at any given moment of the day, early morning, night, whenever, when services aren't open, and then they're just left to wander the streets. And so instead what we can do is we actually coordinate and can actually pick people up and um, transport them to some sort of inter intervention as opposed to just being left to the streets of Santa Rosa. You may have touched this, but any, uh, what are you doing if anybody's evicted from the encampments as that, as that happens? Where, what's the best thing to do there? And what are you doing? In terms of evict, well, we're working, the, we're running the navigation center. And okay. so that's what Catholic Charities uh, role in the camp is. Okay. And so they would come and see you mm -hmm. at the Navigation Center mm -hmm. at that point? Yep, okay. which is right on site and um, also our regular street outreach team and our regular services as well. All right, we have time for one more question, and that's what we can all do, mm -hmm. uh, both at the oh, college go first, and in I'll the community, <laughs> to support the work that they are doing. Thank you, Robert. Like I mentioned earlier, um, for me a real big thing is education. Um, don't demonize the folks who are experiencing homelessness. They're real people. Um, and actually thinks, how are we going to actually end someone's homelessness? So if you're contributing to something that is not that path for ending someone's homelessness, I would just encourage you, talk to some subject matter expert. There's some other ways about doing that. Um, one of the things that we're about to do in downtown Santa Rosa, I don't want to give a time frame, but we're going to put up some donation meters. So if you see that person out on the street and you want to give them something, I would ask that you give it to the donation meter, because what's that going to do? That's going to go to a service provider, and right now the Conservation Corps, who does a lot of the cleanup in downtown San Rosa and Railroad Square, that funding will continue more hours so they can do more cleanup. Volunteer at Catholic Charities, yeah, I can throw your plug on that, <laughs> uh, or other service providers, because one of the things when I talk about housing first, the philosophy, the evidence-based part of housing first is not necessarily the philosophy that if you all have all these issues going on, how do we expect you to solve them wait till you get in your house, okay? That's not necessarily, that's the philosophy of housing first. It's the actual implementation because once they get in there, they need supportive services. Like Jenny was saying at the Palms Inn, you know, how do I shop for, you know, soap, uh, things for my bed? That's where I think there's some opportunity for volunteers, even just coaching and mentoring. How do you interview for a job? If you've been living on the streets for 15, 20 years, those are some skill sets you probably haven't developed. The same thing even just with working with SAY, transitional age youth. If you've experienced the criminal justice system as a youth, how do you know how to ask someone out that you want to go out on a date on? If you've been in custody that whole time, those are skills that need to be taught. Volunteers are wonderful persons who can do that, either through SAY for transitional age youth or Catholic Charities. So those would be a couple that I'd offer. Um, quickly, I'll just mention that I know we're out of time is um, get to know in a, in a way that feels comfortable to you and that's volunteering with your nonprofits. We have huge volunteer needs, humongous. 
Noreen, who is our volunteer coordinator. I didn't even know she was coming, but she's here. So if you want to volunteer for Catholic Charities, there's the person right there that can help you out. You do internships? Um, yeah, we do internships. Yes. But also, if you haven't read in the paper, I'll just quickly mention, um, Catholic Charities is embarking on a, on a one-of-its-kind uh, new development project, and we're calling it Caritas Village, which is um, Latin for love and charity for all. And this is going to be a really important project to see where is the public support on the issue of ending homelessness. We're proposing to completely redo an entire, almost an entire city block in the name of solving homelessness and providing housing to our community, our low-income community. And we know that we're going to have to be bold in our vision, but we're going to need the community to help support us because we can't do it on our own. And we know that there's going to be people who are going to have some concerns that if we can show that the community owns this project and that we want to be a part of it, that we can really make an impact on solving homelessness and taking it past, you know, just managing it. So that's another project you can come and get to know about. You can go to our, our uh, website, Build Caritas Village, which is C-A-R-I-T-A-S, buildcaritasvillage.org and learn more because that's going to be a, a huge project that's going to be um, going on for the next few years. Sure, you'll be hanging out here mm -hmm. to talk to folks. Thanks a lot to Jenny Lynn and Tom.